Hey guys, Chad here. And today in this video, I'm going to be sharing with you the 5Y analysis. And specifically, I'm going to be teaching you how I use a 5Y analysis to get to the root cause of a problem. I'm not going to be like a lot of the other videos and training, I guess, systems out there where they give you some scenario, walk you through the 5Ys and get to the root cause very easily. If you've ever been taught the 5Y analysis, a lot of times we get those scenarios, right? Here's the problem. Here's how you can ask 5Ys and get to the root cause. If you've ever gone out and tried to solve a problem or get to the root cause of a complex problem using the 5Y analysis in that way, I would argue probably nobody's ever done that. And if we could do that with just the 5Y analysis, right? If we could get to the root cause of very complex problems just using the 5Y analysis, then I would say scrap all the other tools, right? We don't need any other tools. We just need the 5Y analysis. Now, I also want you to be aware of the altitude at which you're using the 5Ys because that makes a difference. So you should have some metrics that you're meeting with your team on regularly, right? Maybe you're going out to some daily visual management process and you're looking at their metrics and as they're going around and they're talking about their metrics, surely they're going to be some red metrics. And so those are the ones that they're going to be talking about and maybe bringing up some sort of a problem. Now, in your mind, you might be thinking, I can walk through the five whys with that person to get them thinking about what they're saying on a deeper level. And that would be true. That altitude, in my opinion, is very low in the realm of what I'm talking about with root cause analysis. So if you're asking five why as sort of a, I don't know, deviation of kata coaching to get the person to think deeper about what they're saying and the reason they're giving for the why, that's okay. If you're trying to use a 5Y analysis to get to the root cause of a complex problem, that's probably not okay. Now, as I thought about this video and how I'm going to teach you the five whys or show you how I use the five whys to get to the root cause of a problem, I was like, I can't just show them the five whys. I have to show them the five whys and how it fits into the overall picture of getting to the root cause of a problem because the five why analysis is just a piece of the overall puzzle. In order to show you that, I've got to give you the entire 10 step process that I use to get to the root cause of a problem. So this is my secret sauce. This is what I use every time I encounter complex issues. But I learned this from Japanese teachers when I was working in Japanese automotive. And it is the exact same process I've used in Japanese automotive or automotive, aerospace, biotech, life sciences, back office, Fortune 500 companies, like using this process for issues involving finance, accounting, HR, those types of processes. Things we think of transactional in nature. Now, just for complete transparency, I want to go over a couple of resources that I will be using in this video. One of those resources is a funnel. That's a funnel picture that I took from a book called Learning to See by John Shook. It's an excellent book and a great resource for people that are interested in learning like the coaching mechanism of when you're coaching a person on getting to the root cause of a problem, how that conversation goes back and forth. John did a unique thing by putting those two things together in this book and demonstrating how to get to the root cause. I think it's a fantastic resource. I'll link that book down in the description below. Now, I'm not affiliated with John Shook or his book. I just think it's an excellent resource. In a future video, I'll do a proper review of that book. Another resource that I'll be using in this video is called Lucid Charts. Lucid Charts is just an online software program that you can use to create charts, graphs, and that kind of thing. And I'm not affiliated with Lucid Charts either. And so here's the funnel I mentioned earlier as a resource we we're going to use from learning to see. And you can see it's a great way to visualize going from a big, hairy, audacious problem, right, or perception of a presenting problem down to the root cause and countermeasures. And along that journey, we see we got to get to the real problem. We've got to get to Gimba to measure and analyze what we think might be the problem or the causes that are causing that problem all the way to the direct cause. And then we can start asking why, why, why to get to the root cause and countermeasures. Now, a few things I want you to pull out of this. One, this top part, right? Solving world hunger. Two, getting to the real problem. Three, the direct cause, right? That's important. And we'll talk about that. Four, where the five whys exist. Notice they're not up here at the perception of a problem. They're way down here. And I'll show you why that's important as we walk through our example. And you can see how the funnel lines up with my 10 steps. So I start with the perceived problem as well. We get to clarifying the problem, which I'll show you how to do that in a moment. Now I did add in protecting the customer. That's important. We want to make sure we protect the customer. We go through a factor analysis with the experts to get down to what we think could be the causes of the problem. And then we build a data collection plan go to Gimma to measure the information on the data collection plan. And then number seven, we get to identifying the direct cause. Number eight, we can now do the 5Y analysis 
to drop down to the root cause and countermeasures. Now let's look at how we can do this in a succinct way. So again, starting with a perceived problem. We're never presented with a real problem when we're first talked to about an issue, whether it's read on metrics or whether we have a customer complaining about an issue. For example, in the excerpt we'll be going through from the course here in a moment, it's about an A and B component coming apart. And so that's the example we're using. We're never presented with the actual problem. We're usually presented with symptoms of a problem and we have to dig deeper to get to the real problem. Now, as we process through this example today, I want you to remember a couple of things. With a problem, you're looking at y equals a function of x. y is the output. y is the result of something. While x are the inputs that could cause that output. So, for example, if you have a flat tire, right, you know that there's air leaking, of course, right? You have a flat tire. That's the output. The inputs could be a lot of things. Could be a nail in the tire could be that the stem has disconnected somehow and is leaking air. It could be that your tires are too thin and they're leaking air. It could be because you had a blowout. It could be because a plethora of things. So those are the inputs, all of the inputs that could cause that output. And so you would have to go in and look at all those inputs to determine which one's causing the problem. So remember that as we process through this. All right, so now we get to clarify the problem and we're going to run through this really quickly. But what I want you to pull out of this part are the five W's and two H's. That is the what, who, when, where, why, how, and how many. And so what is the problem? Who discovered it? When did they discover it? Where is the problem? Like you, when you ask where, don't just ask where on the part. You want to be asking where in the world is it? What region is it in? What country is it in? Did the problem occur in? Manufacturing site. Did it occur in? What line did the problem happen on? Where on the part did it happen? Where in the process did it happen? These are all the where questions you should be asking yourself when you get to the where and filling that out. And the why, why is this a problem? Well, for our example, we had a couple of components that were not uh, staying together. They were supposed to be glued together and they were coming apart in the example. So basically they cannot, the customer cannot assemble, assemble this part now into the proper location. How was this discovered during installation? So we wanna know how was the problem discovered and then how many. Now, when you get down to how many for our example in the course, for this one anyway, we had five, but I want you to remember this. It could be how much, how long, how short. There are really three units of measure you want to think about when you're thinking about a problem definition. And those three units of measure are money, time, and quantity. And then we want to make sure that we are protecting the customer, right? That's steps two and three. So we want to ask the question, is the problem still occurring? Is it still happening? So we want to check for any internal process issues that might be happening. And if there are issues, if we pull a sample and we still see the issue, then we have to initiate some kind of quality alert and then define an alternate process to protect the customer. Step number four is factor analysis. Now from this information we've done with the five W's and two H's, we can get down to a problem statement that will help us start the process of our factor analysis. So let's look at that really quickly. So you can see for our problem statement, we said on January 6th, customer X reported that on January 5th, five of our A and B assemblies are falling apart during installation. So all of this information was used to create this really succinct problem statement. And now we know what the problem is we need to be looking at, and that is A and B assemblies are falling apart. And we can use that problem statement to fill out the head of our fish in our Ishikawa, where we can start looking at all the factors or inputs that would be causing that output. So generally speaking, you would have on your Ishikawa man, method, machine, material, mother nature, and measurement. But for this example, we're just using material, method, and machine. And then, because we're just trying to make this as quick as possible, um, but you can see that we've gone through factor analysis. Now we go and we build our Ishikawa or our fishbone using the experts on the process. So we call a meeting, we go out line side if we can, and we write this on the wall, this fishbone, we draw it on the wall, and then we just start going through what are all the things, all the things, all the possible inputs or factors under these headers, these categories that could be causing our components to fall apart. Very qualitative in nature, meaning we don't have numbers here most of the time, no metrics. It's just we're looking at what could be the possible cause. And then we go through a process of prioritizing which ones we think it is based on the experts and experience in the room. And from there, we can build our data collection plan. So now we get down to data collection plan. And so you can see like we, we looked at a few different things here. One being angle of the nozzle, glue expired, not enough glue during dispense pressure applied, like is the pressure being applied during assembly enough and how much pressure is applied or 
the time, sorry, the time that the pressure was applied. So sometimes you have to apply some type of pressure for an extended period of time to make sure the A and B components are stuck together. So again, this is very qualitative in nature, no, no metrics here, but we're just saying these things could be the problem. Now for simplicity, let's follow the path of the red here. So let's say we identified that the angle of the nozzle is probably the number one thing that could be causing insufficient glue, which is causing the components to come apart. So we go, great, well, if the angle, if we know that the angle could be the problem, what is the angle currently and what should the angle be? And this is the data collection we would have to go out to Gemba to start measuring that. So let's say we go to Gemba and this is our results. We found that the current state of the angle nozzle is 175 degrees. Uh, versus a tar target of 120 degrees. So that becomes our direct cause. So the direct cause is the angle of the nozzle. That's also known as the mechanism that caused the real problem, right? So now we know the mechanism that caused the problem. Usually when you have these problems, you're going to have a mechanism of the failure, the mechanism that caused it, and some sort of process that allowed it, right? So you always want to address both of those. And the reason for that is if we went out and we said, oh, look, the mechanism that caused a problem is the nozzle. Let's just bend the nozzle back to way the, at the right angle it should be. Well, can that nozzle get bent again? Of course, because we haven't addressed the process. So we want to address both the mechanism and the process. We only get to the five whys now, right? We're asking why was the nozzle bent, right? Let me get rid of these lines here. So we know the direct cause, right? The angle of the nozzle is bent. We can say, why was the nozzle bent? Now, a couple of things I want you to know with these five why since we're here. One, you want to make sure that when you state this, you state it as an issue. In other words, you don't want to say nozzle bent because that doesn't tell me anything. Maybe the nozzle is supposed to be bent at a right angle. I don't know. You want to state it as a problem. And here we stated it as current state of the nozzle is 175 and the target is 120 degrees. So that, that way we know that we have a target and we have an actual. That's a problem. It should be 120 degrees, but it's bent to 175. Then you can ask the question, why? Why is the nozzle bent? And when you go through your whys, make sure you answer the why with some kind of proof or evidence. Why was the nozzle bent? Because someone bumped into it. I mean, maybe you got that through interviews, right? You interviewed the operator and the operator said, yeah, you know, the people bump into that thing all the time. Then you go for the next why, you ask, you're answering that because why does someone bump into the nozzle? because there aren't any nozzle guards protecting the nozzle. Now for the proof, you could go out and take pictures. Then you can ask, why are there not any guards protecting the nozzle? Because that failure mode was not identified in the FMEA or failure modes and effects analysis, which should be done for processes. And you can say the evidence is we looked at the FMEA and it wasn't there. And in this example, you don't need any more whys. You've, you've gotten down to the process of failure. So the root cause would be, insufficient FMEA during design equipment setup. And the countermeasure to that would be update the FMEA with a modified RPN and then implement autonomous checks at startups, breaks, and lunches. So those are two different countermeasures. One's update the FMEA with modified RPN. Now RPN just stands for risk priority number and it is the result of a multiplier and the multipliers are occurrence, severity, and detection. I have a video on an FMEA and I'll post that in the description below. So with these countermeasures, updating the FMEA have addressed the process I've also added a process check-in of implementing autonomous checks, right? That means that the operator is going to go out and make sure the nozzle is not bent at lunch, breaks, and at startup. And why do we do this? It's possible that once I bend the nozzle back and I update my FMEA, someone could come out and bump that nozzle again and bend it, right? And so now we're right back into the same scenario. I'm trying to reduce the time of defects with making sure we have these checks in place. So, if, for example, let's say I perform a check at startup and the nozzle straight, or it's at the 120 degrees it should be. And then I go out at my first break a couple hours later, and the nozzle's bent. I know that I've built a couple hours worth of defects. Now, that's if we don't want to spend a little more money and do something like add, add guards to protect dispenser. So you could add a guard to protect the dispenser and that way, you know, no one can bump into it and bend it again. If I were to do this, I'd still do the autonomous checks for an, probably a short period of time just to make sure it's working. And then I would take away the autonomous checks. So now as we kind of step back and look at the five whys, I want you to take away this. One, we've gone from qualitative to quantitative, and that's what goes here as the direct cause. 
Two, I want to make sure that you're, when you're asking why, you also have a because, so you're answering the why, and then you have some proof that proves that from Gimba evidence. So those are the ways that I have been taught to do the five whys. So I won't get into a bunch of different branches because I use this process to kind of drive down to the direct cause before I ask the five whys. And if you look at it in this scenario, these five whys would be here. The direct cause would be the mechanism that failed, right? Right here. And then these five whys would float into here. Now feel free to use this. Don't worry, I am going to put all of this in a nice little packet for those that wanna sign up for information regarding this root cause analysis course that I'm putting together that will walk you through each one of these steps in detail. And we're gonna go through several scenarios where we go through um, a manufacturing process and we also go through a back office process. So I will put a link in the description below where you can go sign up for that information. And when you sign up, you'll get all of this in a nice little packet for you. I hope you got value out of this video. If you did, make sure you click that thumbs up button down below. Throw me a comment. Now, maybe you don't like this process. I don't know, maybe you have your own process. I'd love to see it, love to hear about it. This is the one that works for me.